everyone. Let's get started. I'm very happy and honored to invite my colleague Dave Brown here from the National Nuclear Data Center. I'm going to read his, or at least a portion of his, of the description that we have about Dave and his essential role. But first, let me start with his history. Dave got his bachelor's degree at Clarkson University in Potsdam, New York, which just alone shows the kind of fortitude and strength of character that you need, because that is a really cold place to get your bachelor's degree from. <laughs> um, he, uh, so after getting his degree there, he went on through Delaware to MSU, where he worked with Donald Danielovich, right, as your thesis advisor, um, getting his PhD in 1998. Um, he then went and worked with George Birch in Washington, which is impressive as well, um, and not nearly as scary as I think is living in Potsdam, if I could say so. And then went on to postdoc and remained as a staff member at Livermore, and that's where Dave and I principally worked together. Um, he was working on the, the theory and modeling side, and I was on the experiment side. We, we, we shared the collective trauma of uh, doing the plutonium 239 N2N cross section. Um, in some sense, I would say Dave is probably one of the most foundationally important speakers that you could imagine hearing as a room full of nuclear engineers. Because he is, um, in addition to being senior scientist at National Nuclear Data Center at Brookhaven, he is the NDEP library manager. So if you build your life on nuclear energy, you've built your life on NDEP. Okay? Really, it's such an incredibly essential tool. So this is the man who leads that entire um, process. Um, no, uh, we don't have a leader. So. I guess that's a, that's a true <laughs> It's a loose confederation. That's right. <laughs> but he is the one who manages to keep the whole thing work, working and moving. And, uh, and now I can say also that um, his research, your current research focuses on elastic and inelastic scattering at the interface between resolved resonance, unresolved resonance in the fast energy region. And in particular, that last bit we're going to be sharing some fun and games over the next few years with working on U-238. So, with no further ado, Dave Brown. Thank you. So, very happy to be here. Um, so, I am going to tell you about NFB8 because that's what we just spent the last five years of our life fighting with. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, start, I just want to tell you where you might have seen it. Uh, so, say here, nuclear data underpins many different codes. And I say codes because most people, when they use nuclear data, they're not using the data files, they're running somebody's code. Whether it's MCMP or scale or JON, if you've ever heard of that, or uh, burn up codes such as origin or cinder, you're, you're using the nuclear data and it's deep down under the hood and you're just pushing a button, but the data is there. And anyway, each one of these codes has widgets that switch between your NDEF or NSDEF data and uh, models, and it's usually based on speed, fidelity, or fidelity to physics, and whatnot, um, but the data is there. And, uh, and the last thing I say is, in addition to just the plain data tables, uh, these other codes, there's also codes like a Tsunami that can use this data to do uncertainty quantification. Uh, these two pictures I have over on the right, these are just eye candy. But uh, <laughs> the top one is a scale model of the uh, uh, advanced test reactor in Idaho. Um, scale uses that, um, This lower one is the uh, Atlas detector modeled in JAM4. If you don't know what Atlas is, this is one of the large detectors that are uh, that's, uh, at the LHC. So you think, well, like, what the heck does that have to do with nuclear data? Well, you have to do shielding calculations for these things. Because, you know, that K short meson, when it ranges out, it knocks out a neutron, and that neutron activates stuff. You need the nuclear data to do the, the dosage calculations. So even if you're a high-energy physicist and you think this is all stupid, low-energy nuclear physics, I don't care about it, they're using nuclear data. <laughs> okay, so, uh, before I get into NDEF, I want to tell you a little bit about how data gets to NDEF. And for that, I, I did this really uh, poorly thought out visual called the Nuclear Data Pipeline. And um, so the end result are the, the users, and there are many different users. You have lots of pictures. Now, I don't really like this metaphor because if you look at it too much and you're a homeowner, it kind of reminds you of your sewer system, <laughs> and the users are down here at the receiving end. It's not a great metaphor. But fine, let's run with it. Uh, data rolls down. <laughs> rolls down hill. That's right. <laughs> Everything begins up at the top here, where uh, things are published, and there are a lot of different kinds of things that we should be interested in being published. Um, there's code development we do, uh, and this appears a picture of the Empire Code, which I'm a co-developer of. Um, all that code development gets published. In addition to that, 
uh, you know, experimental data also gets published, and part of the, the data program's job is to go out and hunt it down and get it into databases so we can evaluate it. And because oftentimes the, the data is, you know, there are gaps in the data, sometimes literal gaps like energy, 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 I'm missing stuff, energy, energy, energy. And other times it's stuff like, you know, a very important cross section or decay that there's just no data for. And uh, so part of our job is to actually go out and measure it. Not, not me particularly, you don't want me in your equipment, but uh, my experimental colleagues like me. Uh, so uh, now, this experimental data is compiled into databases. And there are three main ones that uh, I deal with. These are uh, managed by the US Nuclear Data Program. The first is nuclear science references. It's really just a gigantic bibliographic database of everything nuclear. Uh, uh, next one is uh, export. This is primarily concerned with reaction data. This is the one I deal with mostly. Uh, and then there's Exxon, which deals with structured decay data. Uh, data in those databases are then combined to make uh, what's called an evaluated data file. Uh, and I'll tell you a lot about the end of version, but we also uh, have an end step, which is an evaluated structured data file. And we also compile things into the Atlas of Neutron Resonances. This is everything you could ever want to know about resonances ever. So um, data once it's evaluated, it gets processed and prepared for the, the codes that I mentioned in the first slide. Uh, so uh, in addition to processing the data for these codes, we also test the data with the codes, uh, both in simulations of, of uh, benchmark systems. I'll tell you quite a bit about that later. Uh, and also we do some quality assurance. And then of course at the end it goes to the user. Okay, and this is just a little cartoon of all the data products that the National Nuclear Data Center hosts. This is our main web page and some of the most important uh, products. Okay. Uh, this here is the most important URL that you've ever seen. <laughs> so uh, let me switch gears to NDEF. Uh, so we just released NDEF on February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Um, <laughs> and uh, as you can see here, I wrote that as 50th anniversary. It turns out that this is 50 years since NDFB1 was released. Uh, although back in 1968, they didn't call it NDFB1, they just called it NDF because they didn't figure there would be another one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, NDFB8, though, uh, as I say, it, it, it integrates contributions from many different sources. And I'm going to just list some of them. Uh, some of them are probably interesting, like uh, to you all, uh, like uranium. Plutonium, <laughs> iron, and, and oxygen. These are part of the Cielo pilot project that, uh, I forget what Cielo stands for, but it was an attempt to build uh, sort of standards quality, full evaluations. I don't mind what that means. Uh, but there are other things from other US programs, uh, from the defense programs, criticality, safety, nuclear energy. There's a whole bunch of new thermal scattering libraries. Uh, there's also some more exotic things like charged particle atomic data, a little bit more uh, atomic data. And of course, all this like on X4. Okay, so this is the part where I tell you this is the best library ever. Uh, this is our cherry-picked plot showing how wonderful the library is. Uh, so this is a selection of fast uh, critical assembly benchmarks we're using to compare the data to. Uh, so there's the benchmark index here. And here's the cumulative chi-square. So it's kind of like golf. You want lower scores better. Uh, and so each one of these uh, steps here corresponds to the chi-square contribution from one test. And some of these are, are important ones that came out from one, HMF-15, Zeus, or uh, I think uh, Gadai and Jezebel are down here. Uh, OK, anyway, important thing is here is NDFB7, our previous release. Here's NDFB8. So on this arbitrarily chosen yet very uh, informative metric, factor two proven. Uh, but this is not the only test we've done. We've done a lot of uh, other critical assemblies, actually thousands. We've also done a lot of transmission comparisons to transmission experiments, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about that later in the talk. And then, of course, we have to call out the DNL for showing the overall quality of the library. Uh, and even we even do this other thing that uh, if you're ever interested in the nuclear data and you want to get involved, we have an annual hackathons where we lock a bunch of people together in, a, in an office. and. They spend a week fixing evaluations. Amanda knows all about this because she gets sucked into one. Um, yeah, OK. So this is a, another plot showing the overall quality of the library. Uh, and this is comparing uh, NDFB7 and NDFB8. In this case, this is uh, thousands of benchmarks grouped by category. Uh, so we've got thermal cases up here, fast. 
and two, based on an intermediate case down here. And what this plot is C over E minus one. So uh, if the if things are behaving statistically, you would expect things to be have a Gaussian distribution of of uh, C over E, and it would be centered on zero because it's a of one. And you see for thermal and fast, it seems to be the case. And so from that perspective, NFV8 looks pretty good. Interestingly, though, in the intermediate case and mixed cases, uh, there's a distinct bias. Um, now, if you don't know what an intermediate assembly is, this is a critical assembly. Critical assembly, by the way, it's a small zero power reactor. They usually like this big, sometimes bigger. Actually, the biggest ones are like room size. But uh, depending on the system, they can tune the neutron spectrum to some extent. And so these intermediate ones, the neutron spectrum is peaked uh, below fission spectrum in what we call the uh, unresolved resonance range. And the fact that there's a bias here indicates that there's a serious problem with the library and has always been a serious problem with the library. And every other nuclear data library you're going to have that, that goes into something like MCP is going to have the same kind of bias. This is a very interesting thing that needs to be looked at. Um, and there's a similar bias for uh, mixed assemblies. A mixed assembly is just one where there's uranium and plutonium mixed in together in some fashion. So uh, whether these two biases are related, I don't know. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, this whole release is uh, summarized in this nuclear data sheets uh, issue. There are eight different, eight, is it eight? yeah, there's nine. Ah. A lot of paper uh, describing the release and every little <coughs> aspect of it. And these are all open access. So if you go Google nuclear data sheets, uh, issue 148 is the magic one, and you can get everything. Okay. So um, this is the outline for the rest of the talk. So I'm going to give you tell you a bit about how we didn't change anybody's answers. And this is important if you're a user. You <laughs> find the code and you change the library, you want the same answer. Otherwise, you get upset. Uh, so we didn't change anybody's important answers. Uh, and so I'm going to go into the detail of some of these important changes, like uranium and plutonium. But then I'm going to talk about some of the other changes. Uh, one of the two of the most dramatic changes are uh, the change to light water and graphite. And Uh, and then there's one other big thing that changed, and it's Iron 56, and that was what I'm involved in, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. Okay, so let me start with that. So I just want to start by saying there are many ways to get the right answer. So this is a, uh, so th this here picture, this is a picture of the Jezebel. This is a ball of plutonium 239, it's about this big. Um, and it's one of our favorite things for testing. This is a very simple system, it's almost spherical. This is a, a model in MCMP of it. Uh, you can see aside from like screws and stuff like that, it's basically a ball. So it's very easy to model. And we, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, this is one of our sort of fundamental things to try to ensure is unchanged. So uh, this, here, so this panel here on the left is describing a calculation done by uh, Eric Boge at CEA. Uh, where he took the uh, Maria Chattel uh, plutonium evaluation and calculated Jezebel and got this K effect. Okay. And he did the similar thing with NFB7, got basically the same K effect. But then he did something interesting where he took the bits and pieces from the Maria Chattel evaluation and replaced it with the NF evaluation. And so over the process of these replacements, the evaluation is slowly going from his evaluation to the end of evaluation. So, um, to these gigantic swings in K-effective when you replace certain things like fission and capture, but also elastic and inelastic scattering. But in the end, even though these are two wildly different evaluations with wildly different swings, you get the same answer. Okay, so we get the right answer. Why we get the right answer is a very good question, and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> but there are a lot of knobs we can turn to make sure we get the right answer. <laughs> okay. So in NFB8, the situation is mostly unchanged. This is the same kind of plot, but this time we have Jezebel, and then we have the solution uh, thermal assembly. And again, we're swapping between uh, a, a Cielo CEA evaluation from Rouge Tel and a CEA a Cielo Lanol evaluation, which is the one that, that um, is in NFB8. And so you see the different swings, but in the end, we're back where you started. Same thing here, even with the solution assemblies. So, 
yeah, we didn't change anybody's answers. Okay, another point is uh, we have covariances on a lot of the data. And uh, this is a, another calculate, set of calculations. This is uh, from uh, Mark Williams at, at Oak Ridge. He, he recently passed on, sadly. But uh, before he, he did these calculations, and uh, this, what he did was he took a series of solution assemblies for uranium and uh, took the uncertainties in NDEF and propagated them through using Tsunami. And so what we have here is the, the calculated K effective values with the experimental uncertainties given in the benchmark handbook. And then here are two uh, versions of the error band propagated through from the end of files. So what this is telling you is that uh, we get the right answer with really big error bars. And so you can't tell how bad things are. <laughs> no, but we've essentially engineered the mean and this now reflected in the, in the covariances. I, I'm not doing a good job of selling this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let me tell you about some of these important changes to uranium-235, to uranium and plutonium. So um, these were uh, both, all three of the isotopes were done as part of the Cielo project, and they share a lot of common features. And by the way, I find this neat pictures of uranium because like, I didn't know what it looked like. It looks like metal. <laughs> um, I'm a theorist. <laughs> <laughs> it's like real things. Hmm? Looks like oxidized metal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so there were a couple of things that went into this evaluation. We have the, the new neutron data standards for the fission cross sections, new P of new, I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, fission energy release, new uh, uh, fission neutron spectrum, even added fission gamma spectrum. Uh, and then, of course, we have feedback to benchmarks. That's how we make sure the effective voice impact one. And uh, we also did some other changes to the resonances. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the standards for a little bit. So uh, the neutron data standards, uh, these are actually uh, a set of reactions that are designed to be standards in the same way that like the meter stick in Paris is a standard. Uh, these are things that uh, are very well known and you can use the, these uh, data sets to normalize other things you might measure. So they are, uh, you know, this is the collection of the, the, the cross-sections that are part of the standards project and the energy range in which they're valid. And just to show you the quality here, I have the uranium-235 and uranium-238 fission. That's these two guys down here. Um, on this plot is the world's collection of uranium-235 data. And in red is the NFB-8 data. And in green is the NFB-7 data, which was the previous issue version of the standards. Uh, you can't tell that they're different. They're buried under the data. And in fact, the symbols for the data are I think, a factor of five bigger than the line width, which is bigger than the uncertainty. And this is a dramatic change for the standards. So uh, they're very well uh, understood. Uh, it's a similar story for uranium-238. So uh, I don't remember what the actual uncertainties are on these, but it's so small it doesn't matter. So. Uh, actually, in a way, this is crucial to why the answer never changes going between releases, because it's sufficient cross-section. Okay. Um, now, if I look at uranium-235, if I'm going to fix the fission cross-section, then I've got to adjust all the other cross-sections so that they add up to the total, which is also well understood. And uh, that's what's shown here in these plots. So these are just four selected cross-sections. So again, we have the fission cross-section, the upper left, the inelastic cross-section, the right, uh, and the capture cross-section and the end-to-end -end cross section. Uh, in all of these cases, the red one is uh, NDEF, the, the, the new NDEF. And you can see it goes straight through all the data. Well, who's gonna pay up here if the data's been uh, so similar story for uranium uranium 238. Uh, and here I just show some of the, the validate the Here's the inelastic uh, forward scattering, average forward scattering angle. And here's an angular distribution just to show that not only did we fix the cross sections, we fixed the angular distributions. More importantly is this uh, on the right, this uh, test was, uh, was done in uh, the simulation of a Livermore pulse sphere. So a Livermore pulse sphere is it's a big ball of, in this case, here, 238 And in the middle is a DT source. And then they measure the transmitted neutron spectrum. So you really get a good measure of both the cross sections of 14 MeV, because that's your source energy for 
neutrons, but also the angular distributions and how because the neutrons rattle around inside there, so it's a good test of the neutron leakage and of these angular distributions. And uh, uh, as you can see here, it's excellent view. Actually, you can't see because the symbols are very light colored, and but they're all on top of each other. I can see up there. So right here is end of seven. Here's end of eight, and here's the data. And down here, the C over E, and you can see there's a bit of a deviation here, in the, uh, but other than that, it's pretty well consistent. And even that, that's a one sigma difference. So uh, plutonium-239 received a bit smaller updates. Uh, the capture cross-section was perhaps the biggest change, and that's what's illustrated over here on the left. But you can't tell that there's a big difference, so we rescaled the capture cross-section by square root of E just to make a uh, smaller dynamic range. And you can see that the new evaluation is very consistent with data. It's great. Um, in addition to this change, we also changed the fission cross-section as part of the standards, and also the, uh, updated the, the prompt fission neutron spectrum. Okay. Uh, the other thing we did, which is uh, new for NDEF, was added a prompt fission gamma spectrum. Uh, this did, doesn't really change a whole lot in a practical sense, but removes one big goof in NDEF where the gammas from vision were put in the wrong spot for 20 years. Now they're actually associated with vision. So uh, for me, that's good. But from a practical sense, it doesn't do very much. Okay. So let me tell you about some of the other changes, namely the uh, change to the thermal scattering law libraries. Okay. So um, I don't know if you guys know what thermal scattering law physics is, but I didn't include a slide. But Basically, this is a, when the neutrons get really low energy, their the Rayleigh wavelength gets really big, and they can't tell that they're scattering off one nucleus anymore. They actually have to scatter off coherently or incoherently over uh, off of a bunch of nuclei. So it's completely different physics, and so there's a completely different way of analyzing it. But it's very important for uh, real life because that area where the neutron, the energy range of interest for this kind of data is like a thermal neutron, which is what you get if you have a water moderated reactor or a graphite moderated reactor. So uh, it's very important data. It's very different from what we're used to using. And in NFP8, we had a, a lot of changes to those sub -libraries. And So this is one of them. This is a, this is a picture of the treat reactor at Idaho. Uh, the, uh, after the Fukushima uh, accident, they wanted to uh, reinvigorate the materials testing in the United States. So they wanted to reactivate this reactor uh, that was used for materials testing. And, but it's graphite moderated, so then they wanted to have a good graphite evaluation to go along with it. And so the uh, thing is, graphite's, uh, graphite is, as According to Wikipedia, is this nice, beautiful hexagonal lattice back home, nice and neat. And these are the lattice spacings, all beautiful. But in uh, real life, in a reactor, didn't like that. It actually looks more like this. It's got pits and holes from radiation damage, in addition to the manufacturing processes, also introduces irregularity. So there's a, it's actually it turns out to be a very porous hexagonal lattice. And so uh, dealing with both the ideal graphite and real life graphite was an important part of this. And so uh, this is probably our cleanest test of it. This is a, um, this is a test of uh, in this case, a Proteus reactor. It's a pebble bed reactor. Uh, well, you can do a bunch of things, but the, the, the calculations are of it in pebble bed mode. And this is what the pebbles look like. Uh, so uh, this plot is a plot of K effective for different case numbers. And the gray error band here, this is the, the experimental result for K-effective. And these different band, different curves here are the different evaluations. And black here is NF7, so it's not so great. And green here, this is that perfect hexagonal uh, lattice that we learned about in textbooks. It looks great sometimes, but it's always sort of on the lower end of the, the uncertainty band. Uh, a 30% porosity one that seems to be on the upper end of the band sometimes and in the middle the other times, but this 10% uh, sort of porosity version seems to be the, the best choice. But in fact, in real life, you have to go in and understand the experimental specifications to find out the density of the graphite to pick the right one. 
So uh, this is a big change, and it's confusing a lot of people. But um, I think it's an important one. OK, uh, next big change was to light water. As you know, this is uh, water reactors, fresh water reactors. So it's kind of an important evaluation. This here picture is a picture from Sandia Labs. Uh, they have a pretty cool assembly that's uh, made out of a lattice of uh, HU rods and in a big old tank of water. And I believe that's Gary Harms' hand. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. But I hope that's got rods coated with something. Gary Harms. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a uh, plots of the, this particular evaluation. This was actually done by uh, the Central Atomico Veroloche in Argentina uh, using their their um, well, their version of Enjoy and their version of um, light water model. Uh, I'm not going to go through it much, except to say they did uh, some testing as a function of temperature, uh, and you can see it has this nice behavior. Uh, like NF, previous NF, and this is NF B6. Um, now, um, it seems to be a nice evaluation and it has good temperature behavior, but it turned out that um, there was some testing which indicated that this, uh, the high temperature behavior was uh, did strange things. Um, yeah, um, like Fukushima kind of strange things. Maybe Chernobyl, like. Anyway, uh, it's been fixed, but uh, I'm going to show you some testing. <laughs> uh, so uh, this particular test is a Neptune test done by Rolls-Royce. Uh, it was a, actually a spent fuel test. So they had these two uh, cisterns, I guess they were, with spent fuel rods inside them, and then a bunch of detectors surrounding them. And they could move the cisterns back and forth. Uh, this was this is picture here. Well, the, the fuel assemblies in the cisterns. But that way they could um, bring it close to criticality, take it away, fool around with it, and they can heat the water, which is kind of important if there's a reactivity increase as a function of temperature, you want to raise the temperature. And so this is a plot of the, the temperature dependency of K effective uh, using different libraries. So let's see. This is uh, NFB7, which is uh, this is, you know, I'm not sure what the right answer is supposed to be. Probably it was proprietary and they didn't put it on. Um, but anyway, what you're hoping is that the reactivity as a function of energy stays constant so that you can control it. Um, so NFB7 was good even if it was low. In, uh, in red, it's NFB7 with the new light water, the beta four version of light water reactor, uh, light water evaluation, you can see it's kind of increasing and it continues on up here in a scary kind of way. This has since been fixed, and that's what's shown in the green, and it's nice and flat, and also less on the upper end. So um, I hope this is good. The, the naval reactor people are happy with it now. Okay. So uh, we move on to the last thing, which is iron. This is like one problem that I have with the library, and it's even more problematic because I was involved in this evaluation. Um, there are a lot of problems. Uh, anyway, iron, of course, is in anything that has steel. So uh, while we focused on iron 56, there were a lot of other things we should have cared about. And this is just a random list of things you find in steel. We think that, oh, chromium's not on. We think chromium is the, the, the bad player. So uh, in the case of iron, um, uh, the resonance region we took from an old evaluation from Foner. He did a very good job back in the 80s, so there was no reason to improve it. Uh, that's what's shown in red and green. And in fact, everybody uses the same evaluation because it's so darn good. Uh, we did make one minor change, and that's uh, right here in this energy range around the 24 kV. This is the, this famous iron window that is used as a neutron filter in neutron sources. We, we move it up a little bit. Turns out to also have big astrophysical impact because 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's a whole other talk. <laughs> uh, just that one little. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, for the fast region, we uh, did a whole set of calculations with Empire, uh, and we, in addition to fitting all the cross sections and all the available data, this is a particular dissymmetry reaction, uh, iron NP. We imagine here's the covariance matrix we generated to go with it. Um, we have this for uh, all the fast observables. Uh, yeah. um, there was one issue, and that's uh, the, you know, the total inelastic cross section. Uh, we didn't quite know what to do. So yeah, here's the elastic cross section and the world's collection of data. It's not very constraining, especially up here. <laughs> this is one of those gaps I was telling you about. Um, so looking at the total inelastic, we, this, is, this is what we have. So red is our evaluation. Green is the previous end-up evaluation. And in blue and black are the world's collection of data on the total inelastic. You notice that they don't agree in here. So the question is, what should we do? Um, this turns out to be a very complicated problem because um, when you shoot neutrons at iron 56, um, you may iron 57. Um, so that's stable. So how do you get to the magnesium? NP. NP. Magnesium 56. That's right. NP. 56. Yeah, magnesium 56. The NP, you make yeah. magnesium 56, which is made in the case back. So then you have that funky correction you have to do. Yeah. Um, so there was some disagreement about the correct nature of the correction. And so we went high, and we should have gone low, but a little lower. Um, so Making this choice means we have to make a different choice over here in the elastic. And this actually impacts uh, real life. Um, this is the plots of the angular distribution. In general, our evaluation has a really good angular distribution. But that one little difference in the cross section makes the world a difference. Um, you can't tell it here. This is a, a collection of critical assemblies we had that were sensitive to iron. These were not particularly informative. Um, we improved the performance a little bit in 12. We maintained the performance in 8, and we made it worse in 4. But you can see here is a difference. I mean, it's a very busy plot. But these are the kind of changes we're talking about here. So it's not very, these were not very constraining tests. Shielding benchmarks, on the other hand, were much more constraining. This is one example of a quasi shielding benchmark from RPI, uh, where it took a hunk of iron and stepped in energy and looked at uh, the gammas. And uh, here's NFB8 down here. And here's some of the other libraries. And you can see right here around one, uh, one MEV, we're a little high. Um, yeah, this is natural iron. This is iron 56. So it's reasonable from this plot to think that this is actually a problem with something else. Uh, actually, it's a little bit of iron fatigue and a little bit of other irons. Um, uh, so, but to, to give me to that, here's another uh, transmission experiment. This is done at IPPE in Obnitz uh, in the 1980s. They took a big natural iron sphere. They also did one with a slab. And they put a DT source or a Californium source in the middle and then looked at neutron or gamma as leaked out. And on the left here is a very busy set of plots showing the results. So in the black here are the, the neutron spectrum. And in red is NFB8, and green is NFB7. You see NFB8 looks pretty good from this one. Down here is a C over E, and there's a slight difference here, around 2 to 5 MeV, but on the whole, it's a significant improvement. That's great. But this is with a DT source, so that's 14 MeV. If we look at, look at California, the situation isn't so good. So this is two very busy sets of plots. On the left is gamma leakage, on the right is neutron leakage. So if we look at the neutron leakage first. <coughs> this is the C over E, and you see here around 1 to 2 MeV, NFB8 is significantly worse. This is the inelastic scattering goof coming in the bite us in the butt. Um, this is the gamma leakage on the left. You see it's not so terrible. Actually, it's pretty terrible for everything, but what are you going to do? Uh, OK, so we still have a lot of work to do with iron, specifically correcting the inelastic scattering. 
And while we're at it, we can actually improve the angular distributions a little bit. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the plan for fixing this, because it's not as easy as just diddling with the cross section. So a lot of structural material tend to be near what, what, what we know in nuclear physics as closed shells. So these are these magic numbers in the nuclear shell model where you have a closed shell, all the neutrons or all the protons are all paired up. And your favorite structural materials have to be like zirconium, right, this magic number. Aluminum, but it's just right between all these magic numbers here. Sodium, okay, it's not a structural material, but if you want like a sodium cooled reactor, you probably need sodium. Uh, calcium, that's, that's concrete. Titanium, vanadium, right here. Iron, magnesium, chromium, nickel, just about anything you find in steel right around here. And if you started thinking, oh, I'll make a lead cooled reactor. <laughs> so, structural materials are problems for a lot of reasons. And why? Because if I look at iron, it's just a prototypical case, these fluctuations go to very high energy. And you can see it right here in the inelastic cross section. Going up to like two to four, even six MeV, there's still a hint of fluctuations in the data. Even if you squint hard enough, you might believe it's up around 10 or 12 MeV. Most nuclei, the fluctuations die out, out around 200 keV. But this is what you get if you have a magic nucleus. These fluctuations go very high in energy. These fluctuations, of course, impact leakage. This is a cartoon I got from uh, someone doing studies with their uh, sodium 23. Uh, in a sodium cool reactor. So here's the just a cartoon of neutron fluids from fission spectrum or for a thermal reactor, and here's sort of an epithermal cartoon connecting the dots. You run a calculation with, uh, in this case, uh, I don't know what LMFBR stands for, but it's sodium cool. Here's a sodium cross section, total cross section, and you see it's knocking out these chunks right out of your spectrum. This is really impacting leakage these fluctuations. And these fluctuations, as you can see, go very high in energy. So they are a problem. And what's more, these fluctuations, if I look at iron again, these are real live neutron resonances that if you had a fancy enough experiment, you could actually see. Uh, the low energy, you can resolve them, of course, experimentally. But high energy, up here on you know, 5 to 10 MeV, there's still fluctuations. But uh, matching them with an evaluation is tricky. What we did was literally connect the dots. Um, probably we could do a lot better. Especially since at higher energy, uh, we're connecting the dots, yes, but we know there are resonances here, but we're not resolving them. We're connecting the fluctuations, so we're not really doing something honest. Um, so uh, we've embarked on sort of a multi-pronged effort to try and get a handle on these fluctuations. Um, first one is just basically doing QA on the, on the res resolved resonances. And we're working with Oak Ridge to re revisit the re resolved resonance evaluation and hopefully extend it higher up in energy. But while we're doing that, we're also looking into uh, changing the prescription for the unresolved resonances so that perhaps we can treat these fluctuations statistically. Um, and that brings up the question of super radiance, which if you would have been up the hill uh, an hour ago, you would have heard me talking about super radiance. Um, also, we, of course, have to follow the grand set of Nelson. That's the fixed in elastic. Uh, and we have to do a lot more benchmarking. Um, yeah, this plot here on the right is just a, a test of the super radiance in zirconium. Okay, yet another structure material. And that little bump does not look very super. It's super radiance. OK, so uh, this is my main message. Uh, NFB7 was pretty good, uh, but NFB8 is much better. Both libraries, of course, have K-effective baked in for the important, uh, important nuclei. Uh, it's by design. It matches the standards, but there's a little more to it than that. Uh, and clearly, there's a lot of room for improvement. But that said, it is a pretty good release. And if you're interested in trying out the files and you can't wait around for the next version of Scale or MCMP, you can download it from our website. And this is my last slide. Um, <laughs> so, it turns out that there's an uncertainty on their anniversary. <laughs> the C-Suite, the, the collaboration that makes NDEF, was formed in 1966. But the first release didn't happen for two years later.
so looking back on one of your slides with the standards, you had looking at kind of an uh, odd element, helium-3, with yes. a 50 keV. Yes. Why 50 keV, and what happens if you simulate, say, any Well, so when they set up the tables, this is a, what they did was they looked at the world's collection of data, and they decided the data could be believed over this range to this range, and made it to agree, and then fit it. And it, they also fit these ranges, sort of to build up a Bayesian network going from hydrogen all the way up to uranium. Uh, but they also were meant to be things that are easy to realize experimentally. So, okay, admittedly hydrogen, you wouldn't make a, a, a gas target as tricky. But it's in the water, so you can do things that way. Uh, helium, I don't know why helium-3, uh, probably because it's common in detectors. Yes. I don't know. Uh, lithium NT, that's just a very popular reaction because that's going to be tricky. I don't get the logic between boron, except that an alpha out is a very easy thing to do experimentally. Uh, but why the alpha, the alpha plus gamma choice, I, I don't know the justification for that. Uh, we have iron energy, carbon, no, carbon, that's something we use. You've got better be part of the standard. Gold capture. That's a standard because it's monoisotopic and it's a freestanding foils of beautiful things, so that would just have to be. <laughs> um, and, it, and it's nice and smooth. You might think there are other monoisotopic, monoisotopic elements like aluminum, but aluminum is one of those horrible structural materials with fluctuations <laughs> that we can't characterize. Bad choice for a standard. Gold's a good choice. Um, and then uranium-235 and 238, they have to be a standard because and then uh, the last thing, the California vision spectrum. Uh, this is everybody's favorite source in the laboratory, so that has to be the same. So I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I did a simulation of the helium 3 in the MEV range. I was wondering what sort of error bar it one should I? It's a good question. I don't know. Also, uh, how, how soon do you think JR4 will update their MDF libraries? I think they may have already done it. But in JAM, there's two actually different ways of getting the, the neutronics. Uh, there's, a, there's an old school way, which uses a Enjoy and a Scotch tape. <laughs> That's what most people use. And then there's a, a new one being developed, at, well, it's a collaboration between Livermore and Stanford uh, to suck the data in from the GNDS format. That's sort of the trajectory that we're aiming for in the future. Were, it, were there any format changes in the files? Many. Especially ones that happened really close to the release and that made a lot of people quite angry. But uh, there's PMU. So what that is, is uh, when you have a fission event, uh, the, uh, you think, how many neutrons am I going to get out? You don't get out the new bar, because it's like 3.1. I don't know what a 0.1 neutron is. <laughs> you get a distribution. So the new bar is only the average value of the distribution. The distribution is PMU. Um, traditionally, it's actually hard-coded in MCMP, TARP, and various other transport codes. Now we've taken it out of the transport codes and put it in the data file so it can be updated as part of the evaluation process. Uh, that broke a lot of things. Uh, we also changed, uh, we also made a, a new dependent fission spectrum. So in other words, the fission spectrum can in principle depend on the number of neutrons emitted, which makes sense because if you have an event that has a large number of neutrons coming up, yeah. on average they have to have lower energy. It's a different fission spectrum. Right? So that format is there. We don't have data that uses it yet. Um, and there are a couple other little ones, but um, those are the two big ones, and they haven't yet been propagated through into the transport codes. Um, yeah, so actually on this plot right here, the 35 fission cross-section, mm -hmm. it looks like there are resonances or some kind of fluctuations that are added in the 8 that weren't there in the 7. Did, or am I just looking at that wrong? Yeah. The, the uh, well, um, no, seven, 7 is buried under 8. Okay, so the 7 is also But there. the blue you're seeing, that's Jeff. Jeff made a different choice. They smoothed this out. Uh, 
And I don't see general at all. Oh, I think general is down here, but you can't really see it on this plot because it's too low resolution. Uh, they made a different choice. Yeah, I was going to ask if those are resolved, for instance. So I guess so. Um, no. No. From, from here to here. Hey. <laughs> From uh, here to here, this is actually the unresolved resolution. <coughs> it turns out, and they, they did a cheat because when you have, when you there's actually a disconnect in the file. In the unresolved residence region, you get the average residence parameters, and then from those you're supposed to compute a probability distribution for the cross section. Now, that probability distribution is the thing that tells you that if there are fluctuations, this is the odds of getting the cross section being that big versus that big. When you build in some of the fluctuations into the average cross section, you're essentially double counting the fluctuations. Because you're saying, if the PDF is this big right here, you could draw a cross section that's really this big. Right. But if you have an average cross section that's this big and you add your PDF on top of it, now you're sampling like this. So there's a disconnect in the file that I don't fully understand and that I'm not happy with it, but this is part of the standards cross section too. And I personally think that this may be related to the poor performance in the uh, intermediate spectrum assemblies, but I'm not sure. Was that a substantial change in alliance? Yes. <laughs> um, some of it disappeared uh, by design, because when you do an evaluation, the uncertainties are supposed to go with the mean values, right? You just can't mix and match, like make one mean value and then grab a covariance from somebody else and stick it on. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> so when you redo the evaluations, you have to redo the covariances. And so then you may be choosing a slightly different way of doing representing the data, so then you get different sets of covariances. Uh, in the case of iron, actually, not only did that happen, but we threw away some of the covariances in the old evaluation because Android wasn't capable of processing. So users are never going to see it. So we threw it out. Um, maybe we could have put it in, but we have, a, have no way to test it. So um, yeah, they changed. Um, How do you think about lead? Lead did not change, and it needs to change. It's a whole other discussion. Um, has to do with those fluctuations. Uh, the, also, the angular distribution is pretty screwed up. It's screwed up everywhere. We need a new evaluation. So, what is now you've a few new uh, gone through the CLO treatment. Mm -hmm. So, what happens if you come along and you bring in new data to these nuclei? Is there a plan amongst all the participants in CLO of how that will be dealt with? Because there's agreement now, right? That's the whole idea. Well, there is an agreement, and I don't think there's a plan. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so, well, so in the in the uh, U.S. and well, most of the world, we went in one direction with the uranium and plutonium evaluations. CEA went a different direction. So we may get the same K effective, but we went two different pathways on this. So we didn't come to an agreement there. Uh, in the case of uranium and plutonium, there will be new experiments and they will be updated because everyone really cares about plutonium and uranium. Now, the other isotopes, oxygen and iron, uh, it's not clear whether they're going to, what the plan is. In the case of iron, we're deeply invested, emotionally invested in it because it didn't do what it was supposed to. It's a pain in the butt nucleus. So, but we will be reworking it. But in the case of iron, uh, it's always part of steel in practice. So you can't just do iron 56 because you have all the iron isotopes, chromium isotopes, and cobalt, and you get the idea. So uh, we're right now focusing on reworking some of the minor ones and looking at chromium. Uh, Los Alamos is looking at nickel. Um, and, but they all sort of need to be reworked a little. And then, of course, we have to fix the inelastic in iron 56, which I think we actually are. Side of the next set of the plan for CLO? Did, did you hear some rumor? Uh, I don't know what it was. Uh, last I heard, chromium was one of the choices, but 
which chromium I don't know, but there's all the chromium. Aluminum oh. didn't make it right. It's too bad because aluminum is like everywhere too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> zirconium didn't make the cut either. So uh, why chromium made the cut and these other ones did, I, I don't know. Whatever the logic is. Uh, but in the next CLO, there will also be a reworking of plutonium 239. That's still in. And hey, uh, I'm going to use close time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but also, I think uranium 238 is still going to be worked on just because the inelastic scattering didn't get a solid treatment as it could. Uh, now, on light nuclei, <coughs> I believe, but I am not sure, that sodium is in the mix. But don't go around that. Uh, Other questions? Dave will be around the rest of this week. I think oh. what, what, are you leaving? Dave will be around until Wednesday, but you know. But you can always love him by sending him an email. Yes, it's true. He does. He responds. So, and in the meantime, let's thank him again.